The Baltimore Ravens picked up a 20-19 win in week one of the 2023 preseason against the Philadelphia Eagles, and we dive into a full stock report, who helped their roster status, who didn't, and so much more coming up next here on Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here, making us your first listen each and every day on this show. Free and available, all podcasting platforms. That includes over in video form on YouTube as well. And again, we're a five-day week Ravens podcast. What are Ravens news, analysis, updates? We have it here for you Monday through Friday. So be sure to subscribe in audio form. Be sure to subscribe in video form as well, where if you're watching in video form, you might be thinking, Kevin, what is this background I've never seen before? Well, if it isn't obvious, I have moved and we're, we're, we're working with the background a little bit. You know, the lights are a little weird right now. I'm trying to get everything in order, but we do have some stuff from the old setup. The little bird is in the background there. But the new addition, which I'm excited about, is we actually have live fish in the background there. There are three live fish, the guppies up there, and then there's a snail that's just kind of moseying around on the bottom. They don't have names yet. It's, it's, up, to, it's up to the viewers. It's up to you guys what, what you want to name the fish. Either there's a yellow one in there, an orange one, and then a bluish one. And if you have any fish names, be sure to put them in the comments below. You can tag me on Twitter. We'll have, we'll have some fun with it. I want to I give the listeners an opportunity first before I put it out on Twitter. So I'll give anybody who's listening or watching the show that opportunity. But we'll, we'll work with it a little bit. It's not a finished product, of course, is moving is super hectic. But we're working with it for now, and, and that's okay. But we do know that the Ravens won their first preseason game of the 2023 preseason they've won plenty of other ones prior to that as they extend their preseason winning streak to 24 games 20 to 19 went over the eagles and we're gonna be diving into a full stock report from that game we, we kind of did a preliminary one right after the game if you didn't know we do do live streams right after each and every ravens game now it was our second ever one that happened on saturday so be sure to subscribe on youtube turn notifications on for the notifications of when we go live but will it also be available in audio form after the fact? But so we'll dive into who stood out versus the Eagles. And then in the second segment, we'll move into who hurt their stock. Then finally, we'll get into the biggest preseason takeaways that I had personally from that game against Philadelphia. So in terms of who stood out against the Eagles, I would say first and foremost, Tyler Huntley to me did. I thought he was the best performer out of all three quarterbacks, honestly. And it was interesting because Josh Johnson started the game. And I was kind of thinking when that happened, I said, oh, okay, well, Tyler Huntley – probably just isn't going to play. And I guess Baltimore feels pretty confident in him as the number two guy, but Tyler Huntley got reps. He played after halftime went at eight of 11 for 88 yards and a touchdown. I thought he looked poised, was making good decisions, crisp throws. And was just, he was making the easy read, which I think for Tyler Huntley, that's an area of growth for him that I'm very excited about. Now we didn't really get to see him a lot in like deep ball action. He had a beautiful touchdown throw to Devin Duvernay or to Tyler Wallace, excuse me, Josh Johnson was Devin Duvernay, but he had a beautiful touchdown pass to Tyler Wallace. It was actually the Josh Johnson touchdown and the Tyler Huntley touchdown touchdown were pretty much the exact same play it was you know the corner of the end zone opposite ends but it was a back shoulder throw which the wide receiver adjusted to and made a play I thought Huntley played really well in this game and I was impressed and I, I would say you know there were some questions coming into the offseason about whether Tyler Huntley would be the guy at quarterback for them but well backup of course Lamar is the starter but I would say Tyler Huntley probably you know put a pretty good grip on, on the backup job and I'd honestly be pretty shocked if he lost it at this point, considering I thought Josh Johnson looked okay. Like I didn't think he looked great. I didn't think he looked terrible. I thought it was just kind of, eh, he, he was, he was fine. And then Anthony Brown, we'll talk about him in the, in the second part of the show. He uh, definitely struggled. Other guys who I thought impressed, you know, just going down the list. I thought Justin Sill had a really good game. Three carries for 48 yards, broke off that long 37 yard gain. He, he looks fast. He looks explosive. I thought he had a great game and, and solidified his spot as the number three back behind J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards. But there's a there's a new challenger for a roster spot here, and we've been talking about him a lot on this show. I know that Ravens fans are starting to get familiar with him. There have been a couple of guys who have already been on the on the train for a while. It's Keith Mitchell. 
Keaton Mitchell had a really great game. Now the box score won't tell you that, right? Six carries for 11 yards, but he had about, what was it? A 35 yard touchdown called back due to a holding penalty where he ended up juking two guys in one move. And just, he was so electric on the field. He was returning kicks out there. He's somebody that I think is a very, he has a strong chance to make the roster because there are multiple factors that teams have to consider when they're talking about, oh, who's going to make the roster and who's not part of that is, well, a guy gets swooped when they get cut. Well, will a guy put a waiver claim in or will, will a team put a waiver claim in for a guy? I think absolutely. And this was kind of brought up in, in my live stream on Saturday by a couple of people who were watching Keaton Mitchell will get swooped. Someone will pick up Keaton Mitchell if he gets cut. I think the Ravens have to keep four running backs this year. I think Keaton Mitchell is too good and has too much potential to lose to a waiver claim like that. I mean, if you remember a couple of years ago, Nate McCrary ended up getting claimed. And I think a lot of people expected him to maybe sneak through the practice squad. You can't always count on that. So to me, I think Keaton Mitchell is one of the clear, clear winners of this game. And a guy whose stock is honestly pretty soaring right now, in my opinion, I think a guy who stood out wide receiver wise, Sean Ryan was someone, and we talked about this on the live stream. Sean Ryan had seven targets, four catches for 37 yards. His seven targets were more than double of any other Ravens pass catcher. James Prochet had three and Laquan Treadwell had three. Other than that, it was all guys with two targets or one target. Sean Ryan had seven and he was making some solid plays. Average 9.3 yards per catch, had a nice 11 yard gain as well. He was someone who I think a lot of people circled is a guy to watch is that six wide receiver spot is wide open. But I think that Sean Ryan made a case for himself. I think Tyler Wallace did too. two receptions for 18 yards in that touchdown. He made a really nice hands catch. You know, Tyler Huntley threw that ball. Wallace adjusted and made a really solid hands catch, which I, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing if you want to go back and watch it. But I know there's, there's been a lot of conversation. Wallace I'd pick kind of Dante Demas as my early favorite for the six spots just because of his frame. I, I since changed that to Tyler Wallace uh, about three or four weeks ago when I kind of thought about it and realized, well, the Ravens love their special teams and we know Tyler Wallace can play special teams. Plus it's a sixth wide receiver. I, I don't think it would hurt to have a guy like Tyler Wallace who obviously a knee injury robbed some of his time at Oklahoma state in college and hasn't really gotten a shot with the Ravens. Hasn't really proven anything in Baltimore yet, but I think, Right now, he is my favorite for the sixth wide receiver spot due to a couple of factors there as well. Travis Vokalek was someone who I thought played really well, too. He's someone who a lot of people have been talking about as a training camp standout. Two receptions for 30 yards, caught both of his targets, had a nice 23-yard gain. I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to make the roster. I don't think Baltimore keeps four tight ends. But as a solid practice squad tight end, I'm totally all right with Travis Vokalek in that role. Defensively, it was interesting. Delshawn Phillips earned the right to start alongside Malik Harrison in this game. Ten total tackles for him. He led the team. I thought Harrison had a really good game. He had five total tackles was flying around early in the game. I thought he played very well. Daryl Worley, I'll give some credit to. I think he struggled to start off the game like very early. He got juked out. He got trucked, but recovered. A couple of hustle plays, including a sack that ended up going for a 23-yard loss. Had a forced fumble as well. So Daryl Worley recovered very nicely. There's been some conversation about Brandon Stevens. We'll talk about him a little bit more in the second segment, but that, that'll that's more due to role. We'll get into that. But he had seven tackles. It was the second leading total on the team. I thought Kevon Seymour made, made some plays. Travis Jones, I thought, had a really good game. He was very strong, used his hands very well. Then a couple of the undrafted outside linebackers, Malik Ham, Kelly Sanders, those guys I thought played very well too. So I'd say an overall, a solid performance by the Ravens. It actually was a game that went down to the wire. If you ended up watching it, the Ravens gave away some opportunities to ice the game. The Eagles got back into it, but Baltimore comes out with the win. Their 24th straight preseason win. And coming up in the second part of the show, we'll be diving into not who helped their stock, but who actually ended up hurting it. So be sure to stay tuned. Lots to dive into on Locked on Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. And August is here, and you know what that means. The official start of Fantasy Football Drafting Month. Get championship ready for your home league by trying out Best Ball on Underdog Fantasy. All you do is one live snake draft, no waivers, no trades. Underdog sets your best lineup every single week. I'm a huge fantasy guy in the Lock and Ravens Fantasy Leagues. I think if all goes right, I'll put out the tweets and, and the posts for the invites today or tomorrow. So be sure to stay on the lookout 
look out for those. But Underdog is the easiest place to play fantasy football and, and the best place for best ball as well. Best Ball Mania 4 is the largest fantasy football tournament ever. And try it out with Underdog's Best Ball Mania tournament, the largest fantasy football contest of all time. is back and even bigger with $15 million of total prizes up for grabs, including an absurd $3 million going to the winner last year. The winner drafted their team in July, so don't wait around. We're already in August here. Visit UnderdogFantasy.com or find them in the App Store and sign up with promo code Locked On to get your first deposit doubled up to $100 as Underdog Fantasy promo code Locked On. We're back here, our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Alshark is still here with you on this Monday, a new era of Locked On Ravens. As again, we have a whole new setup, a whole new background, the palm tree, the beach theme. It's uh, it's all gone. Well, I'm still going like, a you know, ocean vibes a little bit. Again, we have live fish in the background now. You can see them swimming around and doing their thing. So I thought it'd be a little cool aesthetic to have. We're still figuring it all out. But I appreciate everybody who has been with me since the beginning, whether you started on YouTube when we started a couple years ago doing that or whether you go back way further than that. And if you started with me in audio, form i greatly appreciate that it was actually my 4 year anniversary of hosting this show on saturday so a big milestone for me and, and i'm so so appreciative of all the support i've gotten all the growth this show has had from where we were in 2019 to where we are now it's been incredible and, and thank you the listener the watcher it's, it's not possible without you guys so so thank you so much for that but now let's get into again with with all the positives from the ravens game on saturday against the eagles there were, there were some negatives. Some guys did not show up. Some guys did not perform. I think we can start as someone who I mentioned in the first part of the show. I teased it a little bit. Is Anthony Brown. I thought, and it's interesting. I thought that Brown was going to have a lot better of a camp than he's had. We haven't really heard a lot about him so far. Apparently he struggled. And those struggles continued into Saturday night, the, the live action game. Three for eight for Anthony Brown. Seven yards. Seven yards and one interception. It, it just, it was not a great game for him. Decisions were not there. Honestly, Anthony Brown probably could have had two interceptions in this game, maybe three. He, his throws were not great. I think that th this game, you know, there's still two left. There's still the joint practices both tomorrow and Wednesday. So th there's a lot of opportunity, but I would say pretty firmly right now, it's obviously Lamar Jackson as the top quarterback. Tyler Huntley is two, Josh Johnson is three, and then Anthony Brown on the outside looking in. I think Baltimore ends up keeping three quarterbacks this year. We'll see. They, they were a pretty big proponent of that quarterback rule that was passed this offseason. So I would not be shocked if they kept Josh Johnson. But Anthony Brown was someone who just did not look in rhythm whatsoever. And just it felt like it, well, it definitely was not his night. And it felt like he might have lost any other shot he would maybe have it beating out Josh Johnson, but that's why there's still a couple of preseason games left. We'll see what ends up happening with him. I think another guy who definitely hurt his stock in this one was James Perche. You know, we talk about how open that six wide receiver spot is for the Ravens and James Perche, I'd say was a candidate for that. I think pretty certainly he's pretty far out of that conversation right now. Perche has been, I'd say overall a pretty big disappointment. No, look, he was a sixth round pick. A lot of six-round picks don't make it as far as James Proche did. The issue is that James Proche, despite being with the team now, this is his fourth year with them, he hasn't made much of an impact. Despite you know the, the potential is there, he's such a technician as a route runner. He, he's very refined in what in his movements and what he does. The hands are obviously there, but in this game against Philadelphia, had one catch for negative one yard and fumbled on a punt where he was running a little, little loosey goosey with the ball. And an Eagles special team guy came up and just just punched it out and gave the Eagles the ball back deep in Baltimore territory. And look, if that's not a way to get into John Harbaugh's doghouse, I do not know what is. John Harbaugh, one, hates turnovers, two, loves special teams. And James Perche seemingly did not do very well in each of those categories on that one play. So I'd say Laquan Treadwell's ahead of him. I'd say Talon Wallace is ahead of him. Maybe even Sean Ryan's ahead of him, ahead of him at this point. I don't know. But look, James Proche on the practice squad, sure. You know, that's something that I'm totally cool with. I think he'd be, he'd be a solid practice squad player. But I think Baltimore, hopefully they don't have to go so far down on their depth chart this season to where they would need to rely on their six wide receiver to play mega snaps. But I think when you're looking at what that six wide receiver spot should provide, it is positive special teams value. And Tylen Wallace, I think, definitely provides more positive special teams value over what a James Perche does right now because Tylen Wallace has been a really good gunner for them. James Perche did, did not do very well, both on offense or on special teams. Another guy, and I'm sure you know many people have seen the clip already, is Ben Cleveland 
we've talked about Ben Cleveland as one of those guys who I don't, I don't even think it's a surprise. Like I, I know a lot of people maybe last season were saying, oh, Ben Cleveland maybe, you know, winning the left guard job last year. I thought it was going to be Tyree Phillips actually, but then Ben Powers came out of nowhere. But we know what happened with Cleveland last offseason when he missed a couple weeks due to not pass, passing the conditioning test. And then this offseason, there's been a lot of questions about his work ethic. We haven't really heard a lot of buzz about him. And again, the left guard position is wide open. And it's not like they have like all these veterans competing. John Simpson is competing. Sala, their six-round pick from Oregon, is competing. So you would think Ben Cleveland, a third-round pick in 2020. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, that, that's a pretty clear favorite with the way he is and his, his, his just pure size and strength, but he, he does not have, it feels like the athleticism, the clip I was talking about earlier, Jalen Carter, his first NFL snap as a Philadelphia Eagle just blows by Ben Cleveland. And that got national attention because Jalen Carter looks so good and Ben Cleveland looks so bad. I just, I don't know what's next for Ben Cleveland here. It seems like he has fallen to a pretty distant third. Maybe you can even put him lower if you want to, but I'd say it's been pretty disappointing to kind of see the career arc of Ben Cleveland, someone who I personally had very high on, on a lot of my draft boards in that 2020 draft. But again, just, just didn't pan out in 2021, actually, excuse me, but just, just hadn't, hadn't panned out the way that Ravens fans have maybe wanted to see in that career arc has not been very positive for him so far. I think another guy who hurt his stock a little bit, I mean, I wouldn't say it was his fault, but I'm talking Brandon Stevens here. There were some plays that Brandon Stevens, you know, he was involved in. He was close to a lot of completions. The Ravens secondary didn't have a very strong day. It wasn't just Brandon Stevens, but I think the Ravens utilizing him in the role they're utilizing him in. We heard, you know, John Harbaugh talk about how, yeah, we're going to move him back to safety. And he was saying this is what they wanted to do with him. But he was playing corner for the Ravens, and I just I don't think that's where he he needs to be at this point in his career. I think they need to just put him at safety and leave him there. And I'm I'm not a huge fan of how the Ravens have handled Brandon Stevens and kind of how they've moved him around so much. I, I've said this before. If you're an everyday, you probably heard me say it, but it reminds me of what the Cardinals have done with Isaiah Simmons and Zayvon Collins. I think them moving those guys around so much stunted their growth and their development at the NFL level. I think the Ravens doing that with, with Brandon Stevens has kind of done the same. And I understand that, you know, the Ravens love versatility, NFL teams love versatility, but to me, I just feel like they're, they're moving him around too much. Obviously we know the story of him going to UCLA, playing running back there for two years and then transferring to SMU and switching over to corner. The Ravens draft him as a corner. They move him to safety in his first year. And then he ends up playing more in a like versatile role his second season, like corner safety hybrid. And then now they move him to corner again in his third season, but we're saying they were going to play him at safety in his third season. So it's just, it's a weird thing going on with Brandon Stevens right now. But in this game in particular, I wasn't overly impressed. I don't think he was the worst player on the defense. I thought he was like, he was meh, but stock trending just a, li a little down, not, not, not plummeting, but a, a little down for me there. Other guys who I thought didn't necessarily play Super Bowl, Jordan Swan, who was one of the Ravens undrafted guys. He was giving up a lot of completions. I would not be shocked if he was one of the first guys cut. Even Jaquan Amos was involved in a lot of plays that were completions. So a couple undrafted guys. But those are the guys who I thought didn't necessarily impress me. Definitely have, have their stock going on. One more stock up guy is Justin Tucker. And I mean, <laughs> how far up can Justin Tucker's stock go? Actually, we can talk about the whole special teams unit. Jordan Stout averaged 50 yards per punt. <laughs> he had a 54-yard booming punt. So Jordan Stout with that booming leg. And then I thought that Tyler Ott did well in, in his Ravens debut. So a lot to take away from this game from a stock perspective, but there were also bigger takeaways to talk about too. So in the final part of the show, we'll be diving into those. Stay tuned for that. We'll be right back on Locked on Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. And football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long because right now when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. All you have to do is pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory. And that means you can use your bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So, hey, if, if you're liking the Ravens' chances – for a Super Bowl this year, be sure to go bet on them on FanDuel and you can get bonus bets every time they win again in the regular season. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. 
We're back here. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here rounding out this Monday edition episode. Again, thank you so much for everybody tuning in today, making us your first listen each and every day on Locked On Ravens for the everydayers, the people who are here for the first time, or if you're somewhere in the middle, everybody, I, I appreciate it so much that you're tuning in. And be sure to subscribe, follow along, whether that is in video form or audio form. It's the same show, both audio and video. So if one day you want to watch on the TV or on your phone, then the next day you want to listen when you're driving into work, you, you can catch the show and you won't be missing out on anything there. Although I guess, you know, if you want to see the fish, you got to tune into a <laughs> to video form. And again, if you have fish names, you can put them in the comments or I'll open it to Twitter if we do, if we have a, a debate between a couple. So that'll be a fun little way to, to get everybody involved in the new era here of Locked on Ravens. But let's now talk about some big preseason takeaways that I had. Again, we kind of mentioned a couple during the live stream we had on Saturday night. But I think that one thing that I was very, uh, frankly, excited to see is the fact that Todd Munkin and his offense, and we'll get into this throughout the week, but the, the spacing that he had these guys use, part of the issue with Greg Roman's offense, and we talked about it all last season, you know, for multiple years, was the spacing within his offense. Guys were running into each other, one running routes. They had, you know, three wide receivers in the same area. Greg Roman just did not space his players out enough. And it took away a side of the field and neutralized his own players. <laughs> like he, he was getting rid of a, a skill of his own players. With Todd Munkin, we saw him get out into space with some of his guys, you know, putting say flowers into space, putting Isaiah likely into space, or at least attempting to. And to me, that's a huge development. We, we saw a couple screens. I think the Ravens are going to be running a lot of screens this year. But also out of the backfield, Gus Edwards catching passes, Melvin Gore. The Ravens are going to have their running backs be a huge part of their offensive system this year from the pass game perspective. I, I think that's something I took away. And if you remember back in 2021, before J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards had their very unfortunate knee injuries, that was all the Ravens could talk about. You know, John Harbaugh is super excited. Gus Edwards and, and J.K. were talking about it. They, they were talking about how excited they were to show off their pass catching chops and really get involved in that area of the game. I think this is this is kind of like that we wanted to do it then, we're going to do it now type deal where, you know, I still think that Gus Edwards is a quality receiver out of the backfield. J.K. Dobbins can, can play that too. Justice Hill can as well. I mean, all these guys have that ability, but – I think we saw throughout the course of the game, the Ravens trying to get their running backs involved in the passing game, which I personally thought was really, really cool. I mean, Gus Edwards had one reception. Keaton Mitchell had one reception. Melvin Gordon had one reception. So, again, getting their guys involved. I mean, Keaton Mitchell had two targets, and I think that's it's a big point of what they want to do. I'm not saying each, each running back is going to catch 100 passes this year, but I think we're going to see a major uptick in that regard there. I also think – this year, Baltimore's depth, I, I just feel a lot more confident and a lot calmer <laughs> with, with Baltimore's depth. Now, not at every position, but at a lot of them. For example, on the defensive line, at wide receiver, inside linebacker, quarterback even, despite Anthony Brown's struggles. And there, there are others too. I think Baltimore is just very well suited to, if they have to, and obviously you don't want this to happen, but if they have to dip into their depth because of an injury or something happens, they're just from one to six or one to five or however many deep there are at a position, they have players that can step up. Now there is a drop off every time you go down the depth chart. I'm not saying that they have like six all pros at every position, but to me at least it just feels like they have more than they had last year. I don't, I can't exactly put my finger on it, but it just feels like wide receiver. For example, it was Rashad Bateman, Devin Duvernay, James Perche, Talon Wallace, Demarcus Robinson. You go from that to Odo Beckham Jr., Rashad Bateman, Zay Flowers, Nelson Aguilar, Devin Duvernay. It's just if Bateman or Duvernay went down last year, and I said this before the season started, if they went, if they were to go down, it was done. It was done. Their position was done for them, and both of them went down. And guess what? The position was done. But this year, if Odell has to miss a few games, if Rashad Bateman has to miss a few games, because health is a question there, if they do, I'm, I feel much more confident with Zay Flowers being the one to step up, with Nelson Aguilar being the one to step up, even Devin Duvernay. Devin Duvernay is their fifth wide receiver. That that's a heck of a lot better than what they had last season. So I'm just very much so more confident in their depth. But to, to that same vein, I am not confident in their cornerback depth. The Ravens ended up claiming Tay Hayes off of waivers from the Lions on Sunday, a guy that I don't 
I don't really get it. I mean, he was cut by the Lions after their first preseason game. That's not a needle moving move to me. I mean, maybe he turns into something. I'm not, I'm not writing him off, but that's not a move that I think moves the needle. The Ravens had William Jackson, the third in for a visit on Friday. That to me would be more of a needle moving move. I'm not saying it'd be the move and he's going to be an all pro, but that's quality depth. And I'd say veteran depth. I think that's what the Ravens need to go after. The issue is that, as I've said all the time, we're not in March when free agency first opens. We're in the middle of August, and there aren't, there aren't nearly as many options that move a needle. So I just I don't know where Baltimore turns there. I, I wasn't overly impressed by the secondary. Well, I'd, I'd say the corners because the Eagles were picking up chunk play after chunk play. E- even you know the, the rush defense was not particularly wonderful for the Ravens in this game. I mean, the Eagles held the ball for about 11 minutes more than the Ravens did. Passing yards, it was 181 to 139. Rushing yards, 154 to 133. The Ravens actually averaged more yards per rush, funny enough, and that was without Keaton Mitchell's run in there, that one that got called back. But I will say that the Ravens just they, they need to add a corner and probably need to, need to add an outside linebacker too. Today, Vian Klein ended up visiting with, with the Jacksonville Jaguars on Sunday. So there is a market. There's a market for Jadavion and Clowney. I know John Harbaugh said they're also talking to some other guys. I assume Kyle Van Noy is probably still in the picture there. I just think adding a, a corner and an outside linebacker before the season should be the Ravens' priorities as, as they cut down the roster to 53. And, and maybe that's what it is. Maybe there's a guy during cutdown day that ends up getting released and Baltimore sees them as, as a needle mover. And I'm sure there will be a couple of those guys. I mean, the Eagles have so many corners and they don't have they don't have a lot of inside linebacker depth. I know there were some people p- proposing like Malik Harrison for Avante Maddox. That'd be a really good deal for the Ravens. It'd be a really good deal for the Ravens. It's not. It's probably not going to happen. But maybe something like that happens, where a team that is either hurting into certain positions the Ravens are deep at can offer Baltimore corner or outside linebacker depth. But I, I would probably say corner is their biggest need followed by edge rusher. I just feel a little more confident than I have in what Adafi Owe and David Ajabo can bring. Ajabo made some, you know, I'd say young mistakes where he ended up turning inside on a play and ended up giving up the edge outside. So there will be a learning curve for David Ajabo, but I still think that Owe and Ajabo will have years that can cover up for lack of depth if they can stay healthy. The issue at corner is that outside of Marlon Humphrey and Rocky Asin, there, there really isn't anybody who has stepped up quite yet. But that's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first episode with the new setup, the new background, and obviously the fish in the background too. I'm going to get back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens, more Ravens content, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I will see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.